Hello and welcome to the Niche Guarda YouTube podcast series. Once again, uh, powered and produced by Business ABC, former OpenBusinessCouncil.org, and CitiesABC.com. We've been actually on this series bringing global thought leaders and thinkers and entrepreneurs. And uh, there's always a curiosity about the people that actually push the boundaries between disciplines, that actually push the boundaries as well, how we see our world, our society. And I always like to have the concept of the people, the society, the business, technology, and as well the science. And uh, today I'm quite curious, and this is one interview that I probably will learn as much as my audience, about the way we see science, medicine, and a lot of different things in terms of the business of medicine, the business of science, and all the different parts associated. So I welcome to our series, Alex Martinez. And Alex is a personality that you cannot put in a box because he's an executive and entrepreneur with a diverse background in biotechnology and pharmaceutic industries and law. So quite diverse things. He brings a decade of leadership experience in founding clinic stage therapeutics and is, of course, the CEO and founder of Intrinsic Medicine, formerly Lupa Bio a Seattle-based biotech company that has preclinical programs developing the oligosaccharides for conditions including atopic dermatis, autism spectrum disorder, and the rheumatoid arthritis. Prior to his role at Intrinsic Medicine, Alex served in key positions, including the director of corporate development of Ionis Pharmaceuticals, a biotechnology company headquartered in Carlsbad, California, specialized in developing RNA target therapeutics. Alex also co-founded Engineered Care, Inc., and co-founded and served as Director of Business Development and Legal Affairs, and as a board member of Clinical Stage Digital Health Company. With a background in law, Alex was an associate attorney with Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, a U.S. law firm, firm headquartered in Palo Alto, specialized in business, securities, and corporate law. And he received his Juris Doctor from the University of Michigan Law School and his Bachelor in Arts and Health and Societies from the University of Pennsylvania. And he's been working between all these different things of law, governance, and venture capital, and enhancing all this complex world of medicine, biotechnology, and uh, uh, all the areas of business and technology related. Welcome to our series. Thank you for having me, Dini. So it's it's uh, even me touching all these different areas. I always get uh, excited. So I've been quite uh, passionate about biotechnology for a long time. Actually, I, I published a couple of research that I did actually uh, in a long time ago. I did actually a, a, a very provocative presentation and a guest lecture about biohacking the, the DNA of humanity. So you are doing it on a daily basis. So let's start a bit about your background from law to biotechnology and all the different things. But as well, how did you start your career? A bit probably from... Uh, some of your education, childhood, and uh, how do you end up doing what you're doing today? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's great. And, and, and thank you for, for, for allowing me to go back as far as childhood, because as with most things, right, as with uh, like most people who are doing things they're really passionate about, it, it had to start. And so for me, uh, I had a very unique upbringing. I grew up on a farm in Maryland, and my, my parents are certainly overachievers. My father was a physician. Uh, my parents are from the South Bronx. They worked really hard, you know, first generation. My father eventually became a physician. And uh, my mother is a special ed teacher, special education teacher for children with special needs. And they chose to move us out of New York City away from that urban environment and offer us a, a different perspective of life. And bought a 300 year old house on a farm we relied on you know burning wood to keep ourselves warm had to take care of animals and now that i reflect on it that really meant a lot to me because i i got to see my parents serving people and then us working with nature in order to provide for our family so i spent a lot of time i didn't 
watched TV growing up. I watched ecosystems and I participated in, in nature. When I was, I think, eight or nine, I read Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. I mean, I love dinosaurs, of course. So I was super excited about it. And I said, is this possible? Lucky enough, my my father had just got done doing research at NIH and still had access to the NIH library. We were in Maryland, so we were we were adjacent to that. And I was able to go to that library and check out a book, which I think I still have, unfortunately, <laughs> which was called Introduction to Genetic Engineering. And I read that and realized wow, this, there is some amazing technology on the horizon and, and I, I want to know more. And so that kind of really set the stage for sort of nature informed curiosity, as well as, you know, reading science fiction, which has I think inspired a lot of people that are making technologies that change, change how we live today. And then Later in life, in my teens, there was time to stop doing manual labor and start to, you know, learn, you know, vocational skills outside and serve others outside of the household. And so I started working with children with autism and I became an instructional assistant, um, including doing one on one work with both children with, you know, with high emotional and behavioral needs, but also nonverbal children with, with, with autism. And that was a really special transitional point, being able to work directly with the kids, work directly with their families. And it was a very special program. And it was about, it was about maintaining the behavioral progress in the gap between the academic year. And, and so that foundationally inspired me to say, how, how can I serve people and how can I serve them at scale? And so that when, when I, when I went to Penn, funny enough, it was the only college I applied to because I really did not want to go to school. <laughs> I wanted to do something else. And nonetheless, I, I, I got into a phenomenal school, continued to work with those kids during the summer and was able to do a unique major called health and societies, which Really, it was a choose your own adventure. So I was able to look at science. I was able to look at medical anthropology. I got to study health economics. I was taking health business courses in the Wharton School. And during that time period, I worked at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And one of the projects was actually working on an autism waiver that really incorporated funding for both educational and health services for families of children with autism in the region where I had served on the on the ground level. And that program ultimately I don't believe that it, it, it made progress and it was because of the legal side. And so here I am, I thought I was, you know, gonna graduate college, you know, focusing on public health and make a big impact. And I'd say, wait a second, I think I need a new skill in my portfolio. And then two weeks after I, I graduated from college, I was enrolled in University of Michigan Law School starting. While I was there, I actually clerked in the health system. Really, my perspective was always empower myself with education, but have my feet on the ground to understand how it's going to be applied. And while that was a great experience, what I recognized was, wait a second, the practice of healthcare law is reactive. It, I think it's actually perpetuating the dysfunction in this system. So maybe this is not the path forward, but again, a very important skill set to have. And that's when I sort of redirected my attention and I said, I need to learn how to create new solutions. So maybe entrepreneurship, maybe business is something I need to understand. And uh, you know, very blessed to have reached out to a professor at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business, Dr. David Brophy. He ran the Center for Private Equity and Venture Capital there. I said, hey, I'm interested in doing this. And he said, we're putting together a course with with, in, with grad students of, of, of different disciplines, and we're going to create commercialization models and spin out real technology that the university is working on. 
you want to TA the course? And I said, I know nothing about this. And he's, he handed me a signed copy of this book and he said, stay one chapter ahead of the students. Imagine that. And we spun out a couple of companies. One was a transgenic animal company. The other was a clean tech company with flexible feedstock or farmers that could be you know, used for distributed energy generation, especially in developing nations. I fell in love. I just fell in love with with that approach. And then that directed me to, you know, Silicon Valley and got to work at Wilson Sonsini, really a, a, a premier sort of entrepreneurial tech law firm. Well, there I learned learned that component. But again, it, it, it that was just really a stepping stone. I mean, you know, as a as a venture attorney, you kind of look at the same five docs or or like a hundred hours a week. And you know, my heart is on the creative solutions. Luckily, I brought on a number of clients in, in even just my first year. And so I had the opportunity to, to participate in my first company, digital health company. Before that was an asset class. That technology is spun out of MIT Media Lab and Boston Medical Center. Had clinical deployments. Had it funded via CS, uh, Cyrus for Medicare Medicaid service. Deployments at Kaiser, University of Pittsburgh, Hospital Corporation of America. And that was an important lesson in doing where, I mean, the technology worked. It reduced readmissions. They're a huge problem. And, you know, the hospital CEOs liked it. You know, the, the chief medical officers loved it. The CIOs were just rolling out electronic health record systems. So they kind of were like, hey, this is more a burden. So maybe we annoyed them. But it was actually the CFOs that did not like it and really put up roadblocks because they said, imagine this, Danny. They, they, were, they would say it you know, to, to our phases, faces, we make money from patients coming back through the emergency. Why would we want to deploy technology that kept people out? Right. So this is 2008. Right. And so I'm like, wow, what a lesson learned. And, but again, I fell in love with trying to do something new, learning what the rough edges were a problem solving. And I was honored to be given a very unique opportunity uh, that was grossly unqualified for at Ionis Pharmaceuticals. They wanted, I think, a, a PhD with 15 years of pharma experience. I had none of that. And so they made me do a project in order to get hired there or their senior management. And ultimately, that went well. And I got the opportunity to build and lead the competitive intelligence and market research function for that organization which gave me a, a, a seat at every single table, earliest cutting edge research projects, all the way to phase three medical programs, offering strategic guidance on a you know, $275 million R&D budget on the, really the most cutting edge technology, you know, I, I believe in terms of translating findings from the human genome project into sort of RNA targeting monogenic disease pathways. And, you know, from from there, I, you know, worked in escalating responsibility, including, you know, towards the end of my tenure, helping that company navigate um, some safety challenges and coming up with uh, new solutions, including, you know, funding medical device technologies that would enable, you know, monitoring of the side effect of that technology. And while I was doing that, I was working with my co-founder, who he's a patent attorney. He be became a clinical scientist and then was running the regulatory affairs for that entire company. And we came up with a thesis that we could really flip the script on pharmaceutical research and development if we found truly safe compounds, right? If we did a safety first perspective, we felt that we could innovate on both the regulatory and clinical development fronts. So that's kind of my episode uh, that's that's brought me here and that we can get into a little bit of, of intrinsic medicine, but I, I want to take a break and, and let you react to that. No, no. Well, first of all, what a fantastic story. So, so l let's go to the beginnings because in the end of the day, it's for, first of all, congratulations for a fantastic journey. And, and it, I would say that part of it was your parents and as well, the, the mentors that you got in the university. So tell us about that. Cause I think one of the things I always see and talk and I reflect a lot about this, there's a lot of books about, okay, what makes a success career and a failure career? And as well, we talk about bio, biotechnology and the genetics and, and medicine and a lot of things we think, okay, what's the role of DNA 
and what's the role of experience on people. And of course, it's a mix of everything, but uh, sometimes is this, I, I always like to go to this and I would like to touch this because I think for our audience, a lot of people, and I always like to try to be focused on how can we actually be better? And definitely you have a role model and a lot of fantastic things you achieve on that level. So I'd like to touch that. Yeah, it, it's a great question. I And I've been reflecting on that a lot. I, I have a three-year-old son, which is amazing. It, it, that's been just an amazing experience. He was born in the early days of COVID. So we went through that gauntlet. And so he, he's truly a miracle. And he, he, he's probably my, my newest teacher, let's just say. And so, it, so it, it, that's really helped me reflect on the other teachers. And I think what was kind of special about my parents is my my father had the opportunity to build an intensive care unit, and 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 he was the director of that. And I find it amusing. So I didn't know that physicians made money until I was in high school. And then my peers said, "Hey, why why are you wearing those clothes? And why does your mom drive that old car?" Kind of thing. And my parents are just really humble people, and so. Well, my father is out there really innovating in his delivery of care. My mother's doing it, really becoming a champion for, for children with special needs. At the end of the day, we were all there getting dirt under our fingernails, stacking wood in like freezing temperatures together, mucking the barn. Uh, we had cows and horses <laughs> eating that. And so I never saw my parents shy away. They were never above anything. And so they also never were attached to the identity of those careers singularly. And so people didn't know my father was a doctor. They actually would say, you take such good care of your grass. Are you interested in coming and landscaping? Right. So, and the reaction was never one of offense. It was actually, oh, I appreciate you for, for doing that. Unfortunately, I, I'm just too busy to help you out, but, but thanks. And so I think that really framed things. So as I've gone through my career, I've never been attached to a singular identity. I view it as a portfolio of skills. Also, every experience I have with jumping into a company is really, is this the right vehicle for me to make progress toward the public health impact that that I'm inspired by. And 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 what's 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 amazing is when you have that foundational framework, you gravitate towards the mentors, what you're talking about. My mentors in, in college, my mentors at the internships, I was able to interpret the experience and guidance they offered me from that framework. So it's kind of the Bruce Lee approach, you know take what works and disregard the rest and, and continue to, to, to advance yourself. Oh, that's beautiful. And, and I love that. And I love your parents are very, I'm sure they should be proud of you as well, but they're very special people. So, and, and I think sometimes people forget what it takes to, it's like they say, it takes a village and it takes really a lot of things. So before we go to all your achievements, but so in terms of building the career and as well, one of the things that sometimes the universities are very tricky is, is the multidisciplinarity. And sometimes it becomes actually, in my case, for instance, my first university experience was actually quite boring to the sense that I kind of quit during the process. And even when I did my master, I probably didn't take it very serious, but I did it anyway. But one of the things is your multidisciplinarity in terms of approaches, both in terms of areas, very different like law and biotechnology and all the different things. So tell us about how do you manage the challenge of multidisciplinarity? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and again, like it, I've been very, I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity in a formative period. You know, because I was very young. I was in my early twenties when I was in law school, and and when Dr. Brophy gave me that opportunity to work with PhD candidates, to work with masters levels and engineers, to work with Ross MBAs, and because it was a level playing field, we really all had the opportunity to, to, to say mutual respect and, and, and to that helped me really create the perspective that, you know, as you said, it takes a village, right? 
And so each company you almost have to view as a village. It's, it's you're, you're forming a tribe, right? With and if you and you're trying to 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 find you're you're trying to harmonize people's gifts and their aptitudes towards that singular goal, that nucleus that that brought you together. And so having that early experience really taught me that like the true leverage that enables you to be successful in the fulfilling of the vision is trusting others, learning from others, and creating a paradigm of mutual respect as well as respectful communication that and where 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 people can voice their opinions, where we don't judge each other, but we we do interrogate ideas with a bias on on how do we move those those forward. And you know, I was, you know, privileged because I think Ionis did that the same way. They brought in a bunch of different perspectives and they really fostered an environment of, of healthy debate, yet in, interrogating ideas, not people. Um, you know, as a lawyer, I can definitely interrogate people, <laughs> but, but, but when applied to ideas, it becomes that much more powerful, right? And then when you're willing to say, I don't know, but I think you know, and I trust you. Educate me around this. Please offer me a recommendation so that I have something to think about. That's what I think created leverage and an expansion opportunity for me to change the vantage point and change the the resolution of my decision making. And then at Intrinsic Medicine, we're a tiny company. And basically, we early on, Jason and I, when it, you know, it's just the two of us, we came up with a culture statement, right? That's weird. A little tiny startup saying, let's define culture. Let's define our values, right? So that we're always oriented and any conflicts can be mediated, reflecting on those, reflecting on that codification, right? It's, it's how America works. You have a constitution. <laughs> when you have a conflict, when there's you, you look back to that, right? And, and and you know, Jason and I, I think, are people that got good at getting good at things, a lot of different things. And we look for people that then, as we're building the team, that have the subject matter expertise that we can trust to get a key role and responsibility done, but also people that were good at getting good at things and comfortable with doing that and and so that i that's kind of how we've approached things and created this multi multiple disciplinary company with only only a handful of people well that's that's impressive and and it is about people but it's not easy i think it's better said than done so tell then from that experience of, of from the university to the corporate world to create the company so tell us that that journey and how it works to create this company that is doing amazing things. That's why we're here. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's everyone needs to define their own kind of compass rose as they navigate their personal and professional journey. And the and the more we think about it, and this is included in our our intrinsic culture statement, is those are intertwined. We can't compartmentalize people anymore, especially you know post pandemic where people were working from home and we need to, people spend so much time with their coworkers, so much time working that that also has to be a vehicle for personal growth as well. Right. And we need to create humane environments for humans to be their, you know, be their best. And so when we formed the, the company, it was really to, enable that right for us to take all of our experience what we liked what we didn't like and truly seek accountability for how we were going to work and live moving moving forward and so you know part of that was also defining a sort of and i didn't do this early in my career so this is like something that i want to offer people is like define when it's time to move on in a role and that happened to me when I, I finally did that and I realized what it was is when I felt like I stopped learning 
And, and when there was a mismatch between new lessons learned that I felt were meaningful and my energy expenditure and my stress levels. And then that's when I said, I can certainly take on a new challenge, but it has to be one that's going to foster my growth and my learning. And that's really the kind of the catalyst. And then that, that combined with an idea that I feel inspired to advance, that's really, I think, the kindling for, 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 for the company and for Intrinsic. And, and, and that idea was that safe drugs would change the pharmaceutical R&D paradigm that the pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry really was dependent on the findings of the Human Genome Project at that time. So they were focusing on monogenic gene targets, linear pathways of biology, and everyone was rushing for those severe and rare monogenic diseases. But it was, I believe, is because they were limited by the toolkit they had. Those were the tools that they had available. That was the toxicology profiles of those tools. And I said, you know, I, I have a bunch of complex autoimmune conditions, IBS, atopic dermatitis. I had to have part of my, my bowel resected. I actually went through a potential oncology patient journey immediately after I left my stable work to start this company. So I was living a parallel life as a patient while building a patient solution company through intrinsic medicine. So that really is embedded in the DNA of the organization. Well, this is, a, this is very special. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to interview you because when I saw material, I saw a lot of things when it comes to, to all the areas that we get, and, and especially you guys have been doing quite cutting edge research in terms of Parkinson, a lot of different, really super important things. But this takes a huge amount of effort because you guys have to do a layer, like you said, first of all, get the funding to keep this part and clinical trials, a lot of different things. And then there's the entrepreneurial part of this. And like you said, the entrepreneurial part, it's a quite sensitive stuff. So a lot of the things you guys are doing is really, that was just actually what brought me to this interview was precisely the research. So you are leveraging enzymes within the body to deep brain simulation. So taking a closer look at gut microbiome and this research and actually there's a very interesting thing in your website which i want to touch as well but let's start with this because this is kind of for instance, there's a lot of studies if you go to india there's all these mantras and all these parts of the body and the stomach and the intestines are very important then if you go to the us if you go to europe there's plenty of research and even me i was working with the novel medicine and researching to build something about human dna and life, life sciences, medicine. And there's a huge amount of research on this. So tell us a bit when you create the company and that effect that has as well in your health, in you as an entrepreneur and building this and then go to some of why you choose to go through this direction of building this part before we go more technical on some of these things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and basically I'm an impatient person when it comes to delivering results. And so when I went through a search, so basically I'm, I'm not a scientist, right? I'm autodidactic. I've probably read 75,000 peer reviewed scientific papers while, you know, having molecular, you know, biology for dummies right next to me. Right. So that's kind of the way I approach this. So I'm not entrenched in anything. I didn't, I didn't build anything. Right. I, and so I wanted to find something that met my parameters, which was, has to be safe. First, first, do no harm, right? I could never, you know, live with myself if I advanced something that that could hurt somebody. It needed to address what I what I found to be the common roots of the chronic, which is immune dysregulation and dysbiosis of of the microbiome. And thirdly, I believe there's financial toxicity in the pharmaceutical industry. In 2022. The median price of an FDA approved drug was $227,000, right? Like, so even if you're getting the cutting edge, you're worried about your finances. And we can't, you know, we can't do the mind body dualism thing. We know that stress, we know that psychosocial stress affects us at the somatic level. And so there's no way we could say, like, that's okay. And so I created a lens and I said, 
it's going to be one of evolutionary biology. I'm going to look for human endogenous compounds, right? So I think they have a high probability of translating because I never want to go out and say, hey, patients, I found this new molecule that create hope that's really risk adjusted should only is only going to deliver 1% chance of actually helping them in maybe 10 years, right? So I wanted to find something that was part of foundational human biology, but then sort of met my package for rapid translation, where I can say, hey, I'm announcing a Parkinson's study. By the way, my phase two Parkinson's study is approved to start dosing patients in Australia. We're, we're you know, this is within arm's reach of us and some and patients are going to have access this year. That's exciting to me. So yeah, I'll, I'll just take a pause there. I, I don't know if I fully answered your, your question. No, no, you answered it. This is quite impressive. So, so let me, I want to go to a couple of questions as yeah. a, as, as a, of course I'm not, you say that you don't understand, but you are an expert <laughs> and of course not being scientific educated on that, you are in law, but of course your experience and your career made you a global expert on this, but well, that is important. I love that humility, but as well go directly to the point. So when you studied from, and I, I think this is important because everyone the other day has to care about their health. <laughs> it's, it's a key element for all of us. And yeah. even if you be, might become digital beings or digital humans, we need more than, <laughs> than ever around health. So how do you leverage the, so when you start the company and you try to solve some of these problems and you assemble the people, the people, what problems do you want it to solve? I think that's an interesting one because, of course, you guys are doing very advanced research and as well, not just research, there's a lot of case studies and already solutions. But from that part, I think that's interesting for our audience and probably because a lot of my audience are entrepreneurs and technologists, so, but they have their health as well. So I, I like yeah. to see the three levels. Absolutely. So what was interesting, so right after I made the jump and gave up stability, I started getting abdominal pain like every time I ate like severe crippling abdominal pain, laying on the ground in the fetal position, abdominal pain. I rapidly just, my weight plummeted. You know, I had a, you know, pretty, you know, muscular build at the time. I, I lost 40 pounds. I went down to about 140 from like 180 something. And we thought it was, well, I'm really stressed about <laughs> You know, the early days of entrepreneurship, maybe it's a penetrating peptic ulcer and went in for a bunch of diagnostic procedures. And I remember after one, the door opened and a surgical oncologist came in. I thought we were looking for an ulcer and it turns out they found a mass, like an egg sized mass connected to my small intestine. Didn't know what it was. So all of a sudden I'm, you know, posed with, you know, a potentially existential patient journey and went through, we were, you know, putting needles into my abdomen, trying to get, you know, a piece of tissue so that it could be characterized. And that wasn't happening. They were not getting, they were getting acellular material. They didn't know what this was. And so ultimately the decision was made that they needed to do a diagnostic resection go in sight unseen in order to see what was going on, treat it as if it was a malignancy and excise at that period. And, and so when they went in, my what it turned out is that my bowel was so inflamed. I was called a chronic duplication step, which means that in very early development, my GI tract actually forked off. So there was almost like you would think of like a dead end in it. And so food and other matter was literally connected that and it went necrotic so that the tissue was literally dying and it, it around that that kind of offshoot it had created profound patient kind of like an inflammatory bowel disease and so they had to cut off i think it was like 18 inches like foot and a half of my bowel as well as remove lymph nodes because they had to treat it like a malignancy so that, that and then, you know, stitch, stitch me back up. So I, I really went through that experience that was very humbling. It, it was certainly informative, right? To think about like the, the solutions I were offered were not very palatable and ultimately led to that surgery. And then, you know, as part of doing a, a Donald surgery, here I am, I have, you know, 
an immune and a gut microbiome company, and they cleaned out my microbiome. I had to eliminate it, right? Antibiotics, polyethylene glycol laxatives completely flushed out. And then afterwards, I was put on the thinnest of Western diets. I was basically eating pancakes and applesauce, right? As my as my bowel recovered, and there was no support for the microbiome. So I'm a little bit daring, and you know, I'm gonna speak very carefully because I don't want people to rush out and and you know, do not try at home. Okay. <laughs> so human milk oligosaccharides are, you know, one of the advantages of them is that. The infant nutrition market has spent decades and billions of dollars advancing these, testing their safety, scaling up to synthetic biology manufacturing for their inclusion in infant formula. However, they're not they're not ubiquitous. They're not readily accessible. But by virtue of where I was, I was able to access these comp these compounds. They're not the same therapeutic grade compounds I'm developing, but food grade compounds that are you know accepted for human uh, use under generally recognized as safe regulatory dossiers. It was hard to get, but I was able to get them. And so one of my philosophies with intrinsic medicine, it's a lofty goal. I don't expect anyone to do it, but I like to I like to live by example, so to speak, is what would what would our therapeutics look like if every CEO of a company was required to be the first person to take their own compounds? We'd have a lot safer drugs and they probably would work better. You know? I'm just saying. And so I tried that and I've been on our compounds ever since. And it's been transformative for you know my irritable bowel syndrome. I certainly aided in my recovery. And there, there's nothing like trying to drive conviction that the right placebo-controlled clinical studies, the right science should be done in order to elucidate and confirm a lot of anecdotal benefits we've seen and a lot of benefits that are suggested in the, the peer-reviewed scientific literature. So I, I think I navigated that decently. No, no. So, so that means your personal health issues somehow created your company focus in a lot of ways and you become as well the i think the the element of study and actually i i, I can partly relate to that experience because i've been having a lot of problems on that direction as well myself not on that uh, not as big as yours but i had for instance and i think this happens with a lot of entrepreneurs as a lot of relationship with it so it's an interesting one and this uh, this in itself is a podcast and probably <laughs> i think we should do it because it's about how you yeah. react with stress uh, yeah, it's a big one. I think definitely we'll put a second one on that. And I think a lot of people will probably touch that. So so for the sake of time, and I have a lot of questions here, so now you open a Pandora box of questions. But let's focus on now picking in your own experience. And of course, you build these compounds and actually solve a lot of things for you guys. And so on that part, I want to go for is there's one one of the, the things you have in your website that I like a lot is, is precisely about some of these areas. So let's touch that because I, I think that one is quite, quite interesting. So from people that are suffering from these things and uh, from the experience that you build together. So for instance, this year, one of the things here that is, is a podcast is listening to your gut health and viewing your body as an ecosystem. So let's yeah. touch this. I think this is actually probably one of the key elements of your company. Although you have much more than just this, but and this is actually for me actually quite an important one because I suffer a lot from my gut, and I'm sure a lot of people in it in our world do it. Probably people listen to us. So let's go through a bit of your journey on this. But to pause more on the this. outstanding, it's, it's a great question. That's actually kind of one of my favorite ones because the clarity on sort of this this ecological approach is 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 really been timely. I, I've been that's what I've been focusing on in 2024, you know, one of, I think the problems in, you know, again, it's a legacy of the human genome project, which is really reductionist and deterministic on human biology, right? It's, it's saying like our DNA, we're, we, we we have to look at our health with fatalism towards our DNA. That's not the case, right? No one really was thinking about epigenetics at the time. No one was thinking about the gut microbiome at the time and, and, and how, how profound it is integrated, how symbiotic it truly is 
with our, our somatic cells. And so human beings are super organisms. It's just time for us to accept that we are ecologies, right? Humans are participants in nature. And guess what? What are we finding? Physics is telling us everything's fractal, right? So we're part of you know a larger ecosystem and we are an ecosystem you know unto ourselves. And when you start to take that perspective, you understand that everything's bi-directional as well. There's not a linear pathway. And if you offset a linear pathway, you are dysregulating the system. You will see symptoms and you, you will new 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 challenges will arise, new problems will arise if you dysregulate the system in that manner. And so when we look at human milk oligosaccharides, what are they doing? You know, they're the third largest solid component in human breast milk after fat and lactose. But guess what? They're amylase resistant. A human being, they're non-nutritional. A human being cannot break them down for caloric energy. Yet here you have them at five to 15 grams per liter in human milk. What are they doing? These are terraforming agents. These are communication molecules by which a mother can talk directly to somatic cells in, in her baby's body that are maturing the immune system, both the innate and the adaptive immune system, but also the foundational microbiomes. Of, of, of. And one of the ways I like to think about gut health is our guts came before our brains. Okay. This is, this is kind of something I'm working with this year. When you look at a worm, when yeah, you look please at elaborate it, on that one. That's very important. So, so, so look at a worm, look at a nematode, like any scientist will understand, right? The nematode is like the first model system. What is that? It's a free, free living GI tract. If you take out from mouth to anus, everything in between, and you just lay it out there, what is it? It's a worm, right? So that worm that then encountered some colonies of bacteria that formed a biofilm on that passageway, right? That opening to the outside environment and, you know, whatever primordial soup environment and likely an aqueous environment, it encountered a colony of bacteria that said, hey, maybe we can work together, right? Maybe we can become a bioreactor to give you a more diverse a set of resources that will enable you to adapt to the challenges in your environment, right? So I like to think that the microbiome combined with that early GI tract, which did have a nervous system, the enteric nervous system, which now we're all understanding, wow, wait, we have a second brain, it's in our gut. I believe that actually evolved before the central nervous system. So the paradigm that I'm approaching is our gut and our microbiome allowed the more complex organism to evolve. And so that's that's why I think meeting it there, right? I mean, this is not new. About what did Hippocrates talked about this thousands of years ago, right? Yeah. Food be thy medicine, all diseases start in the gut. And so now with this conceptual framework, I'm saying this is it. This is this is really going to be a profound therapeutic intervention point. Um, and I think I'm matching the right sort of human endogenous biology to the task. Well, that's, this, of <laughs> course, I, I think everyone listened a bit to that, me as well. But And that's partly one of the curious things that I wanted to do the interview and makes much more sense. So from a scientific, let, let's look at this from two angles. I, I don't know if yeah. you have time for a bit more sure, yeah, questions. So two questions right now, because I have a lot of questions on your company, <laughs> but this is this in itself is a big thing. So. Tell us a bit of, of course, you guys are VC funded. You have a huge amount of research papers and all of stuff. So yeah. let's touch what you said. So the gut is, a, is like a second brain. And it, of course, the effects, uh, I think there's a lot of studies about the effect in, in stress and a lot of different things. And of course, it's it's actually a huge cause of death as well. But let's look from a scientific perspective, your statement. And then from a practical perspective, because you have both. Uh, if you can touch the both and as well summarize this, of course, we're going very technical, but I'm sure my audience will do research and we'll put all the links for your research, for your podcast, for people to learn, because this is actually useful for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, maybe on the scientific side, I, I can talk about something that's actionable, right? In an earlier question, right? Sort of uh, pay attention to your poop kind of statements. 
that, that I made. And so what we're seeing is just a tsunami of, of, of peer-reviewed public literature, including a lot of clinical observational studies, just showing that the microbiome is important, that it is an intervention point, and that was pioneered by all the fecal matter transplants. So clinical data showing that, you know, take, take, taking healthy donor feces, putting it into somebody that has, you know, a gut immune brain axis kind of mediated component can be disease modifying in a, in a meaningful way. So we know it's an interventional point. And one of the things that, you know, I like to offer everyone is there is a tool called the, 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 the Bristol stool form scale, right? Which, which it's a visual scale and you can look at your bowel movement, right? And, and you can see what's normal, which is typically four, four and a half, you know, again, a visual ranking scale. And that's a, like really kind of a, a navigation aid so that as you are making dietary modifications, you can look at yourself as an individual with very specialized needs and you can set a clear objective for yourself of normalizing your bowels normalizing your, your, your stool. And the thing I like to offer people is that the dietary fiber goals and, and, and prebiotics are really important. That's what human milk oligosaccharides are. You know, I think they're the greatest of all time prebiotics, however, and, and, and prebiotics are what enable you to change the composition of the, the bacteria in your gut and also change what those bacteria are doing. And that's what's really emerging as the most important aspect of the science is those bacteria, right? To my earlier kind of speculation on the origins of this all, those bacteria can produce a whole host of drug-like metabolites, small molecule metabolites that bathe every single cell in our body, including in our brain. These are, these are small, they're active at extremely low concentrations. Um, and so, the prebiotics essentially are upstream of the system, setting that cascades of changing the composition of the, 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 the bug community, changing what they're doing. And that has really profound system level effects for the human organism. And so most people, 95% of, and I'll speak to the American population, are not at that 30 grams per day dietary fiber, that prebiotic level. So that's a huge low-hanging opportunity for everyone to take advantage of a more uh, whole foods, plant-based diet, and then using something like the Bristol Stool Form Scale can use that as a navigational aid to improve their gut health today. You don't have to wait for my drugs. You can do this on your own, and there are plenty of resources out there as the self-care movement has gained a lot of traction as you have like awesome people like, you know, Huberman out there giving people actionable guidance. You have a, a lot of others and we have greater accessibility to, to plant-based foods. So that's, I think one aspect there on, on where I think the science meets practicality. And then in terms of what we're doing, I'm really looking for low hanging opportunities where I can move into phase two studies very rapidly so that I can get people excited about this and, you know, to, you know, both, you know, the general audience, but also to my investors, I can deliver really tangible results that, that, that will confirm that we have something worth future investment, which then will lower my cost of capital, which will enable me to expand these programs, expand my team, scale it, and move faster towards, you know, registration and getting these approved as therapeutics. So, so that means you, if I'm just to translate this for people listening to us, so you're building the case and the research, now we're scaling it to have proof of concept and take it to a bigger product. So from a lifestyle perspective, and of course, there's a lot of parts on the investment on the VC, and yeah. I understand completely. And I hope that for my audience and myself, I'm learning and there's a lot of layers. So from your research, and how do you apply this from research, from an entrepreneurial, and as well from a, a technological side? Because, of course, this implies a huge amount of research and complement data in order to test and move forward. So tell us a bit about the data that you found so far and some yeah. parts that you can actually collaborate. And if you're using any AI, 
Because one of the things I'm working right now is with digital twins. And I'm sure that this, if you have like a data digital twin and for instance, of course, any device has a bit of data about ourselves, but most of us, we don't use it for anything really besides probably silly stuff. Uh, it's a great question. And one of the benefits of what we're doing is, as, as I mentioned, you know, we're standing on, you know, the, the shoulders of giants, right? There was a huge industry endeavor to elucidate the biological functions. And it was, it was both, you know, large food ingredient manufacturers, but also a lot of infant nutrition, academic labs that were starting to characterize these human milk oligosaccharides. They created a, a wealth of data sets, but they were looking at it through a different perspective. They were not looking for therapeutic properties. They were looking at what is sort of the minimum viable package supporting the inclusion of these in a nutritional context, which as I mentioned, they're not. And so, you know, you know, AI is only as good as, <coughs> right? So you probably know better than most. And I'm just learning that, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm new to AI. And, and, you know, this serendipity here is I had one of the richest data sets, independent verification of the biological functions across different models. And so, I had that data set and said, I was the AI. I read, I've read every single paper that has ever been published, every single dissertation that has ever been done, every single thing that has ever been filed on human milk oligosaccharide biology. And so that's what kind of informed our kind of initial therapeutic focus. And then, of course, I say, well, that's not sustainable as I move forward the, the company and 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 need to prioritize delivering and that's kind of where now we're understanding the applications of ai to do that especially now that we're generating our own data and so i have a partnership with an awesome company called arpeggio biosciences and what they have is they have essentially like a, a functional it's a, it's a nasa rna platform but but it's a it's sort of functional transcriptonomics, right? So we can take primary cell lines and we can create kind of a, a disease model of, of the cell phenotype and we can put in, you know, the, the drug and we can look at the sort of the transcriptome fingerprint, what actually changes from baseline. And so we're elucidating sort of direct biological effects in different immune cell types. And then they have a machine learning platform that helps us say, what are we seeing in this fingerprint? You know, we, we, so I get these lava plots and like we see all these different genes moving and we're like, what biological story does that tell us? And that has yielded some new applications, including finding that one of our compounds might be promising for actually a rare genetic childhood disease. So, so that's, and so that's kind of like an early aspect, you know, I did the analog work. Me, well, me and my team did the analog work. We created the pipeline that we have today, right? Where we're, we could design those experiments that, that we're doing. And these are not just experiments where we're looking at a meaningful clinical, clinical endpoint, for example, in my Parkinson's study. Like we're looking at improving the bowel functions of those patients, but also motor symptoms, cognitive improvement. But then we're going to be doing a full multiomics profiling, the gut microbiome, what's changing in their blood. And then that will inform future hypotheses for the research platform. Every time we go into clinic, we're developing a richer data set that we could apply to the legacy data set. And then we can work with our partners who do have some AI and ML capabilities, and that can inform okay, what's the next pipeline prioritization? What's the next thing we translate towards the clinic? Right, that's um, amazing. And uh, I, I think this is right now the way because this is a quite important thing because part of this research and for people listening to us, you went very technical. So I'll try to probably just went a bit more. And, and, and uh, so a lot of this research, like the gut microbiome can actually continue research, can look for new ways to detect Parkinson earlier and slow the progressive of the disease. That means that in a very simple terms, we can actually grow older, healthier and longer. So longevity, yeah. there's a lot of effects on all of these different things. So, well, that's a lot of things here. So let, let's touch this part of the Parkinson probably here. 
put a bit of your hat because of course there's a lot of things here and I, I would love to touch more the lifestyle and how this can be used and I think probably is one thing that I would like to do with you because I, I've been very obsessed with lifestyle and improving lifestyle and even my health and I think everyone should but yeah. a lot of people don't know don't know how to do it and and some people suffer a lot so let, let's just touch what I just said about uh, with this work of the the work that you're doing, so leveraging enzymes within the body to deep brain stimulation and taking a closer look to the gut bi microbiome biome that with the research and continuous can actually look at new ways to detect Parkinson earlier and slow the progression of the disease. So let's start with this quote. This coming from one of your research that you published recently. Okay, so so yeah, this is an important one. Uh, our Parkinson's program is absolutely the one or program like uh, I think it's this is also going to be you know it's not only vital for the people who have been waiting half a century for a new therapy but it, 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 we're we're advancing an intervention that's on the cutting edge of the understanding of Parkinson's right because Parkinson's is really a, a clinically defined constellation of symptoms right and it's been known for a while that patients people with Parkinson's have very distinct oral and gut microbiomes. And one of the things that's really fascinating about it is like up to 80% of patients with Parkinson's have constipation and often it's this preceding symptom. But the way that disorder, that disease was looked at is the question is, is the constipation causal or is it just associated with it? You know, the alpha nuclein, we're seeing it. It's aggregating in the brain of these people. What's with this gut component? And so Brock's hypothesis was that perhaps Parkinson's actually, or a, a large cohort of Parkinson's actually may start in the gut. And there was a 2016 cell publication looking at mice that they were genetically engineered to overproduce alpha synuclein, right? And alpha synuclein is like produced in the context of like inflammation and, and other things that normally in, in our body. And then it you know, resolves. And those mice were then given a, a fecal matter transplant, a microbiome transplant from, a, from human patients with Parkinson's. Lo and behold, what happens? But if alpha synuclein is produced, the mice develop severe Parkinson's symptoms, right? So then that's really suggestive. There appears to be a gut media component in Parkinson's. And so we started working on this program, like at the very, you know, we've been looking at like 2022, right? And in August of 2023, the British Medical Journal published an absolute landmark study looking at almost 25,000 patients with Parkinson's. And what they were looking for, they were they wanted to test Brock's hypothesis. Perhaps, you know, there is a gut association with Parkinson's in this massive data set. And what they saw is that patients with a prior exposure, i.e., a patient history of irritable bowel syndrome, constipation dominant one, had the over four times the odds of developing Parkinson's. And so that is just a, a striking change in, in, in risk. And the HMOs have already shown in an open label study, so the caveat, it wasn't placebo controlled, but there's a very intriguing signal that they may work in irritable bowel syndrome, notably the constipation dominant form. And so my team and I, we were working with them phenomenal investigators our australian investigators are dr nick talley at university of newcastle and dr carolyn sue at just world-class clinician researchers and we look at this totality of data including you know the data that we we have today on the compound the data that was supporting an approved to begin dosing patients in irritable bowel syndrome study that we we got approval in 2022 for Australian initiation. And we said, do we have something here that we that deserves to be tested appropriately in a placebo controlled clinical study of Parkinson's? And they said, like, absolutely, let's do it. And and so this is really a very special opportunity, but that we feel a lot of responsibility for as well, right? Because there are a lot of people suffering and in need where we can look at 
such a strong evidence supporting testing a hypothesis and in a very short period of time no one has to wait you know it's not like we say hey that's interesting in five years we'll have a drug candidate for that no in a matter of months we're going to be testing it in a, a study that that will help us really understand does parkinson start in the gut if so can we intervene well that's amazing and, and i know that how complex for people listening to us how to put this in scientific and in business terms is it's a big big task i've been involved in life science companies so i don't know for the sake of time so i will touch you touch that you so let's look at the technology because of course this is a podcast about technology so i know that DeepMind found breakthrough research in in very advanced parts of medicine that's actually the book of of the one of the founders that i, I actually love the book and the highlights a lot of the breakthroughs that were constituted using deep mind uh, super advanced that was acquired by google so how is your team right now so there's a component of funding and the, let's look at the entrepreneurial and the business model there's a component of funding a component of research and scientific part that we touch and then there's a component as well of massive research but as well research that includes university academic research scientific and and in this case bioengineering or bio medicine related research and then there's are you using technologies for this are you trying to accelerate using research on or some kind of you mentioned machine learning but some more advanced part is something that you have in the list how do you en envision that yeah and one of the things that we've done is, is it's kind of interesting so that's actually what i'm working on building right now i would say i, I kind of hacked it a little bit and the way i hacked it was i i Absolutely believe AI is the future of, I think, kind of like, you know, novel drug discovery. And, and, and I think it'll get us there. I used evolutionary intelligence, right, to build my pipeline. And so I used evolution as a proxy, as an alternative to AI to, to identify it. And, and, and now what that's done, given the fact that, you know, we uniquely have 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 curated this data set and we're then going to have clinical data to link it to, then it's going to enable me to create a bespoke AI, right? So that 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 works within that framework that can leverage the data set. Because, you know, I think that there's also, you know, as as you probably know, you know, AI is only as good as this data set, but it also amplifies bias. Right, it amplifies bias of the model, right? And so I think by me taking a different approach on this, which is one that strictly data informed, right? I, I'm agnostic. I just want to get to truth, right? As close to empirical truth as I can. That then, as I go and I say, you know, I I already have like, you know, you know, beyond the three I have, I have you know thirteen more. How, you know, high scrutiny drug candidates. And then beyond that, I have 180 more distinct compounds within my library. That's then what I'm going to develop a bespoke kind of internal competency to, to evaluate. But I think the most important thing is my priority is early clinical translation, right? I don't want to be sitting here talking about advanced tech when I truly and deliver something to clinicians and patients so in terms of meaning data production early on and chart the regulatory path forward. And then all of those inputs go into my bespoke system development. That's going to enable an evergreening of, of the platform technology. And, 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 and then, you know, that's a mouthful, but most importantly, it's working with the right partners, right? Curating relationships is going back to what we already talked about. I can't be a subject matter domain expert, right? I have to find people I trust that that are smarter than me, that have been doing this more than me, and just sharing the vision, sharing the data, sitting on the same side of the bench and saying, is there an opportunity that we can align our business objectives to make this endeavor mutually beneficial and 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 work together and fundable, right? Because at the end of the day, we need to be able to obtain the resources to move forward. 
So yeah, it's, it's amazing, and I think for people listening to us, I think uh, in Alex terms, if you go to the website in Trinsic Medicine, you have a pipeline of work that some of the cases is in preclinical and status and phase one and phase two, like Parkinson's disease that we mentioned, and the irritable bowel syndrome, which is already HREC approved. So that's quite impressive. But like you said, you are scaling this. So as a wrap up, and we pass almost one hour and a half, there's a lot of questions that I have, but I think we, I would definitely would have a, a, a podcast about uh, some of the yeah, lifestyle yeah. associated with this. I would love to. Yeah, likewise. So on, on, let me, so on the partnerships, because it's one of the areas that I love. And for instance, on this case here, because you are dealing with very, very sensitive, of course, that has to be a touch. And we mentioned about the human milk and the, and part of the microbiome new solutions. There's quite a lot of research behind it. But what would be the areas that you are looking in partnerships? Because I think that's interesting for our audience and, and for me as well to understand, because to build something like this, you cannot do anything without having the FCA and all these regulators, and at the same time, a huge amount of scientific research. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I think this is where sort of that ecological approach also is important, right? I, I view intrinsic medicine as a keystone species in an ecology that I'm trying to create, right? Where we, where we work with academic researchers who they're always eager to see their stuff moving forward, right? And they have the opportunity you know, to run a study, to generate data, and then know that they're committed via partnership with us in moving that forward and making it a reality for, for you know, the patient population we intend to serve. Sharing economics, importantly, right? I want us to be aligned. I'm happy to share economics, royalties, equity, even in, in my company, to gain alignment and also... More importantly, that's how an ecosystem works, right? It, it takes care of the different participants. Same thing with, you know, the manufacturers, right? These, a lot of different manufacturers, these compounds have spent so much money to produce these in a safe, you know, scalable way. So using synthetic biology, we didn't even get to touch on that. I mean, these are some of the most mature products in terms of scaled synthetic biology. It means the COGS are low, Right. What does that mean when I develop this as a pharmaceutical? It means I have latitude. You know, I think these, these products are, they have planetary re relevance. They have relevance because it's foundational human biology to all people. So I have to think about market access from a global perspective, not just pegged to the U.S. dollar. And so when I have low COGS, I can think about novel commercialization strategies early market access. We just brought on some Brazilian investors. That's going to be an early market access opportunity in Latin America. It's different regulatory set, different um, you know, price elasticity that we can evaluate. And so really we look for truly mutually beneficial value-add relationships. And we, I think one of the other fascinating things with a very small team, we have a disproportionate amount of people with legal backgrounds, which enables us to, to quickly look at regulatory frameworks, think about business internationally, and not only create thoughtful partnership, you know, contractual agreements, but also to amend them as necessary, right? One of the things is we're not rigid to that. As business realities change, um, and we have new data. We're not afraid to relook at something and say, is there a way we can get in better alignment to work better together, faster, or efficiently for uh, the mutual uh, call? So, and yeah, so I'll, I'll pause there. No, I think there's a lot of great things and definitely one of the things that comes to my mind and probably is one of the things that I'll take it off this interview, but uh, is is the, the idea of building a community around this, because I think that's one of the challenge. I think listening to, the, to you and even I look at my own problems of this, if you put the community around this, you can actually test. And of course, very careful. There's a lot of communities I, I actually... I didn't mention that, but in, in as a teacher in business schools, I had actually digital medicine as one of my classes for a couple of years. So I learned a lot and, and I work with the Fris Philips Healthcare the case studies that they use a huge case in terms of blogs about people with extreme diseases. 
and how the patients would interact with other patients and it create a huge business out of that. And I think this is kind of very important for people listening to us, both in terms of, of course, today is about what you're doing in terms of intrinsic medicine. And, and I love the work. And that's why I'm bringing something much more technical for this podcast that I'm particularly excited. But it, this touches a lot of layers because like you said, you need models of AI that can learn with the data. We need communities. And I think the future of even, I would say, the how humanities is getting companies like yours skilled on the level. So I probably will wrap up here. I have still a couple of questions, but <laughs> I definitely want to do a round two. So Alex, I want, I want to thank you, first of all, for fantastic insights. Congratulations to your work. For people listening to us, please engage because there's a lot of things to learn. Even what I just mentioned, I think every entrepreneur will suffer with this. So probably learn even your personal case study. It's quite important and very powerful. But as well, whatever can help the audience and the community engage because that's about, like I, I, said, I said at the beginning, a village takes a village. It takes as well a community of people to build some great things that can change the world. I do you want to say some last words just about where people can find, us, find you, a bit more of interaction. And uh, I think this is always good, this interactive part. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'm... I'd say that's one of the areas where I'm most deficient. So I certainly can learn a lot from you about that. You know, check out our website, intrinsicmedicine.com. I think one of the best places to find us is my sort of languishing LinkedIn page for Intrinsic Medicine. Please follow us there. I think that'll be the first channel where I really start putting a lot more things. You know, feel free to, to LinkedIn me as well. I'm also going to be start, start talking more about the journey to hopefully inspire, let people, you know, hear about my mistakes, my, my victories and learn from those so that they can accelerate their own progress. So I, I think that those would be good starting points. Fantastic. So thank you, an honor. Thank you. And definitely yeah. this is the beginning. <laughs>